You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday. I am Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. I'm also the founder of Whole9Sports.com where you can find all of my written work. And I'm just letting you know, this part's going to be a little quick because it's crossover Wednesday. So I'm about to be joined by Luke Robinson from Locked On Bama. We're going to talk predictions, spread, keys to victory, all that fun stuff. And I can't wait for it. But before we get started, just a quick reminder to follow Locked On Gators wherever you listen to podcasts so that you never miss an episode. And please do subscribe to Lockdown Gators on YouTube. It's going to be fun. There's only one place to get all the info you need on the SEC five days a week, and that's a Locked On SEC with Chris Gordy of Sports 790. Follow the Locked On SEC podcast on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast. Now, here's Luke. All right, and now for this first segment, of course, we are looking at who the uh, what big stories are this week and what the big storylines are for each team. And, of course, the Florida Gators, first off. Uh, quarterback has been the most frustrating thing I've, I think, ever seen in my life this year. It's been <laughs> atrociously inconsistent, and I get it. Anthony Richardson has three huge plays this weekend. It's fantastic. It's fun. But Dan Mullen, even yesterday in a press conference, said, you know, Anthony Richardson had a scramble where he picked up 18 yards, but he messed up the protection call. He then missed his primary target, and he missed the check down on it. And he ran, and people are like, yeah, it's a fantastic play because he picked up 18 yards. But at the end of the day, uh, quarterbacks are supposed to make the right reads, and that's been such a huge problem for our Gators. Emory Jones, of course, has just – I don't even know what's going on with him if he's playing with his helmet backwards or what, but it's just been so terrible to watch. And I love him. I'm, I've been a big Emory fan. I know Bama fans are listening to this, so you wouldn't know that. But I'm a big Emory Jones fan, and uh, neither of these guys have been able to – do anything with any even remote semblance of consistency here, whether it's missing reads, just making poor throws in general, uh, taking off when you probably shouldn't and taking sacks or hits when they shouldn't. It's been rough and I have been just dreading this game a little bit for that reason, because we played Florida Atlantic and then South Florida and our quarterbacks still didn't look great. So going up against Bama's, NFL defense, really. It, I mean, we're not going to lie. All these kids are going to be playing on Sundays in the next couple of years, and they'd be playing on Sundays sooner if they were allowed to go into the draft at this point. <laughs> so I, if we're just going to be honest, like I, they have like I am twelve, but they're actually like thirty year olds out here just beating up on kids. Like poor Mercer, never stood a chance. But uh, yeah, this is an NFL caliber defense that the Gators are going to be playing against. So. I am I'm pretty uh, pretty skeptical about how it's going to look for our quarterbacks. Yeah, I think the your quarterback issue is certainly a thing. Um, I remember Embry Jones when he was being recruited, and I remember his highlight films. And I remember thinking, because Alabama was involved pretty heavily with his recruitment, and I remember thinking, boy, I really like the way he runs, but I'm sure he knows about forward pass. Um, <laughs> and I think the statistics this year sort of bear that out where I think he already has four interceptions on the year. Is that right? He has four thrown interceptions and two dropped. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, but, you know, Anthony Richardson has looked incredible. But I, I'm really intrigued by the way you talked about him because I, I'm like everybody else. Um, I'm a locked-on Bama guy. I watch Bama stuff. And when I'm not watching Bama stuff, I'll usually watch SEC West stuff. Uh, I don't watch as much Florida day to day. So um, I've only seen a lot of the highlights and the highlights show Anthony Richardson breaking a gazillion tackles and outrunning defensive backs to the end zone. And and he, he looks fabulous. Um, so I find it interesting that you say he's missed some of his reads. He's, he's um, called out the wrong blocks, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a uh, that gives me some pause because I'll tell you something heading into this interview just a few seconds ago. Um, I have a bad feeling as an Alabama fan about this because I feel like uh, one of our big storylines is to uh, guard against complacency. 
Look, the, the beauty of being an Alabama fan these last 15 years is the best run anybody's ever been on. That's not debatable. It's not in dispute. It is just merely factual. And I know I come off as this gigantic bammer saying that. Um, can't help it right now. It just is what it is. Look, if I was saying this during the Shula years, y'all would have every right to shoot me down. This has been the, the run of all runs. And so I, the, the most incredible thing about it all, and this is where Saban is a genius, and I get so tired of people saying Nick Saban just gets the best recruits and throws them out in the field and says, let the rough end drag. And look, it's really difficult to keep this many egos in check. It's really difficult to approach every game as it is uh, the next week versus, hey, um, we've got to play Mercer this week. And so try not to think about them. Think about Florida the next week. Now, every again, we have a mental lapse. Uh, I thought against Mercer, we looked pretty pedestrian uh, versus, say, when you watch somebody like Auburn versus Alabama State. Now, it's not exactly apples to apples, but I think that um, against Mercer, we should, have, we should have looked a little bit more polished, and we didn't. Um, that be, all that being said, that, that's what we have to guard against is complacency. There were some big-time drops. I'm talking about hit the receiver right in the hands drops uh, against Mercer. And so it felt like mentally we weren't necessarily all in the game. It was almost like we prepared all summer for Miami, uh, beat the brakes off the Hurricanes, and then went into Mercer sort of like, hey, we'll just roll the ball out there and see what happens. While that is true, that is certainly true that Alabama could do that. Without a playbook, I think Alabama would go out there and beat Mercer. Um, the, the issue is when you're playing for Nick Saban, he's not worried about who the opponent is as much as – I want my team to get better because, yes, my players are better than yours as a general rule. So if we go out there and just work on ourselves, we will beat you. So when they go out there and just act like, uh, yeah, we got this in the bag, it it hurts his preparation. So I think the uh, the the theme this week will be getting everybody's mind right. Yeah, um, I mean, that's you usually said, like, you guys can go out there without a playbook and beat kids up. It looked like IMG versus Bishop Sycamore out there sometimes, <laughs> just pounding everybody. Uh, and honestly, like, I'm, I'm just hoping that you guys continue having those mental lapses because I've been very open. I think this is a much better Gator team than people are giving them credit for. Uh, I've been saying that all kind of off season, not just to be a homer here, but I feel like a lot of teams didn't get as faulted specifically for changing quarterbacks as other teams, as the Gators did. Like I think the Gators for switching Kyle Trask, I get it. We lost Kyle Pitts, Kadarius Tony, Marco Wilson, all those guys. But uh, I feel like the biggest thing that people like to kill us for kind of is having Emery there because he's an unknown and all these things. But then Ohio state didn't get, uh, didn't get killed like that in the polls, even though CJ Stroud's been playing terrified out there. And things like that, where it's like, I, it's still such a big issue for us. Where I get it, but I think this is a better team than we've been given credit for at this point. Um, but I'm still like, I need those mental lapses if we're gonna upset Bama and like trick plays because Florida's had their own mental lapses uh, this past week against South Florida. Uh, South Florida threw a double pass where the receiver was eight yards behind the line of scrimmage, and they still fell for it. And it's one of those things where how do you not see that? I'm watching the game from my TV, and I get it. I have a larger angle. of I have a larger field of view than you. But how do you not see that that's what's going to happen when the receiver's back there and other receivers are still running downfield? So mental lapses seem to be an issue for both of our teams at this point. Um, and that's – I think we're going to see one of the ugliest Florida-Bama games that we've seen in a, in a long time. Granted, we don't play nearly yeah. often enough. You know, the SEC championship game was sort of a, uh, a beauty pageant. I mean, there were a lot of great plays, a lot of great players, two quarterbacks that were just playing out of minds. Um, Jones has gone on the NFL and, and played pretty well. And Devontae Smith, I was at the Atlanta game with Philadelphia, and Devontae Smith still doing Devontae Smith things. Uh, Jalen Waddle still doing his thing. So, yeah, there were a lot of dudes on the field with last year. Uh, Kadarius Tony from down in the Mobile area. I was just so mad Alabama didn't pursue him harder because I loved him as a player. Kyle Pitts, I got to see him in the Atlanta game too. Um, 
this one's not going to be that way. And I guess we should expect the mental lapses because the teams are younger and less experienced. Um, Alabama's got a ton of talent on this roster, but when you think about the receivers, it's John Mitchie who's got the experience, and that's about it. It's Brian Robinson, who I guess you would call experienced, but I don't even know that he's got 1,500 yards in his Alabama career yet. So he's been there five years. Uh, that's a long time to be there. Um, so uh, the, the, the mental lapses – should be expected. Now, I, I want to go back to something you said about the uh, Florida not necessarily getting the benefit of the doubt like an Ohio State. I would chalk that up more to uh, the, the SEC getting their respect because here's the thing. I don't think you can look at Florida. And also, I would also say this. The drop-off from Mac Jones to Bryce Young is less than the drop-off of Kyle Trask to Emory Jones. I doubt a Florida fan would argue with me on that. Um, I think that the, there's almost a cavernous drop in a way, at least as a as a uh, Florida quarterback. I mean, it may be in the NFL, maybe somebody can teach Emory Jones to do something. Maybe Kyle Trask isn't athletic enough. I don't know. But as far as the quarterback for the, these Florida Gators, I think Kyle Trask to Emory Jones is a huge uh, step in the other direction. But um, the the other thing is I think it's a nod to the SEC. Ohio State. You know, they just don't play the teams Florida's going to play. Florida has to play Alabama this year. Florida has to play Georgia this year. Um, I would say Florida has to play Florida State, but it, Lord of mercy, if y'all can't beat them this year, y'all y'all going to fire Dan Mullen on the tarmac. Um, so uh, the SEC is uh, it's always a gauntlet. Kentucky's a lot better. You guys have LSU, which, I mean, they're train wreck talented. Uh, Missouri's better. Just on down the list. Um, whereas Ohio State, the one team they played this year is Oregon, and they now they beat them. But if you were looking at the schedules preseason, I think you'd say, okay, yeah, I feel like Florida's going to finish behind Ohio State. That may not happen now, but it, I, if I was looking preseason, that's the way I'd, I'd schedule, you know, score it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's fair. It's they like, got. I, I mean, one of my things I mentioned. <laughs> You're you're right. Where it's like, yeah, the drop off between uh, Jones and Young and Trask to Jones. It, a lot of Joneses. Uh, Trust Emory Jones. Keep it up with the Jones. Is bigger, but um, I I mean, even with Bama, my issue is more just like they were complete unknowns, and they're still very young at this point. Emory's been here for three years, so that's what I was like. I feel like some teams are getting. I feel like the Gators were getting faulted more than some other teams in that respect of just like there's question marks. Yeah, but I I mean, C.J. Stroud didn't throw an, didn't throw a pass in college last year. He he ran the ball all night. And like I said, like he's been playing horribly scared. Uh, it, it's fun to watch, honestly. I kind of hate Ohio State. So I'm cool with it. <laughs> I get you. Now, let me say this about that. That is the way society is right now. We are give me what's behind the curtain versus give me the $500 cash on let's make a deal. Because yeah. you look at the – watch any draft. Uh, Jalen Waddell was coming off an injury, and I love Jalen Waddell. He's fast. He's quick as a hiccup. But he's coming off an injury, and he wasn't Alabama's number one receiver. Our number one receiver won the Heisman Dead Gum Trophy, and he went behind Jalen Waddell, who's smaller in the draft because people are like, I feel like Jalen Waddell's ceiling is higher. They don't know it is. They feel like it is. And um, I think pe- you know, general managers would rather – take a shot at the devil they don't know versus the devil they do. And um, that may go against traditional thinking, but I mean, I think that's the way everybody is now. They, they do that on, on finance decisions. People are like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to buy me some Dogecoin instead of investing (laughs) in Apple, you know, and it may work out. You may hit a home run, but you may also uh, end up in the streets, you know? So um, I I think that's sort of the way it is when you talk about, unknowns and CJ Stroud also was more ballyhooed coming out of high school than Emory Jones was and Stroud did have 484 yards against Oregon I'm, I'm with you he plays a little scared and he when you can throw to that Alave kid everybody can look good but um yeah I, I, I get your point and I think it's valid I'm just I'm not trying to uh, uh debate you on it I'm just saying I also get the other side yeah, of course and we'll be right back we're gonna take a look at some key matchups to watch this weekend and uh I've got a little stat that I'm going to bring up when we get back to it. Week two has come and gone, and I hope you all made some money this week. I know I did uh, because I bet on Toledo covering against Notre Dame, 
So thank you for that, Rockets. As you can see, I got the tattoo and the helmet behind me. So I'm all about Toledo here. Would have made a lot more if he could have won the game, but thanks for choking that one. Uh, bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action. Bet Online even covers award shows, TV shows, and reality TV. With real time updated odds and props on almost, uh, Luke, you might want to cover your ears for this one. Anything you can imagine, it is the best way to place your bets, and it's 100% free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device today and receive your 100% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Make sure to use promo code locked on, that is L O C K E D, no space O N. And now we are back, of course, Luke Robinson. Hi, um, it's key matchups to watch time. A uh, little stat that I wanted to bring up is that these teams are kind of eerily similar in, in one way. And uh, it's not necessarily a matchup, but it's what I think might be a deciding factor at some point in this game. Uh, third downs, I don't know if you looked at the numbers, but I tweeted it out before. These two teams are very similar on third down. Florida offensively converts exactly 50% of their third downs this year. Alabama converts 51.7% of their third downs this year. Defensively, Florida is allowing conversions on 34.5% of their third downs, and Alabama is allowing conversions on 34.6% of their third downs. So that's what I think is going to be, I mean, not necessarily a matchup to watch, but uh, I think that's going to be just so crucial here. I certainly do too. Um, The thing about being in third down, and I think it should be – noted that you know third down in, say, four or more. Uh, if Alabama can keep Florida in third down in four or more, I, w- I would feel very, very comfortable, because especially if, if Emory Jones is the one back there. Um, I think that uh, Alabama's pass rush is pretty good. I know we lost Chris Allen, who was poised for an incredible season. Will Anderson's a little banged up, but it looks like he will play. And – uh, I, you know, keep Florida in passing situations. That's the key. Uh, I do like Florida's receivers. Uh, that being said, when I see that uh, Emory Jones already has four interceptions and, and two dropped interceptions, as you mentioned, in two games against inferior competition, that makes me feel pretty good. Um, Alabama's defensive backs are historically opportunistic, and I feel like they're going to have an opportunity to, to jump some routes and, and make some big plays. Um, in terms of Alabama being in third down, you know, what, uh, what worries me there, look, I like Bryce Young a lot. I, I thought Bryce Young would actually take over the starters role last year over Mac Jones at the, at the beginning of the season. I really thought that would happen. And then it just, you know, Mac just did his thing. Um, but I think Bryce is a better runner than he realizes maybe. He, he's, he's not super fast. He's not Kyler Murray, but he's a pretty good runner and he's elusive enough. And I'm concerned that he that he would rather uncork one on third down when it's third and six versus pick up those seven yards with his feet. There's some positives to that. Alabama's got some Frisbee catching dogs that can go up and get the ball. But um, for me, more of a traditionalist that went to Alabama when Gene Stallings was coaching, give me the first down every time, you know, let's get the first down and then throw one deep on second down or something like that. So um, yeah, I'm, that's concerning to me. And Bryce Young also, this is going to be his first start on the road in an incredibly raucous environment. I think that's a huge storyline. I think that's a, that's a huge matchup, just Bryce Young versus the crowd. Um, I had some Auburn friends that went to the swamp in 2000 and maybe 19, I guess it was Bo Nix freshman year. And they said it's loudest, you know, they've ever heard it. Now these are guys that have been in Bryant Denny and Jordan Hare and, and, Tiger Stadium, and so they know loud when they hear it, and they said it was just crazy loud. So um, I've been to the swamp myself too, but it was in 06, and it wasn't exactly a banner year for us. So uh, y'all were sort of just, hey, yeah, we beat Mike Shula. Uh, you know, not even worth having a beer after. Um, but so, yeah, I think Bryce Young versus the crowd is going to be a thing. Let's, let's remember, he's he's looked good so far. In fact, on, by a lot of accounts, he's the Heisman front runner right now. And I think that's more about nobody else standing out versus Bryce Young being the shining star of the college football season. Um, but he only threw 22 passes in his career leading into this season. And now he's played in the, in the Mercedes Dome, um, which was not a full house and was mostly Alabama people. And then he's played at home against a Mercer team that, uh, you know, is some was exactly what we thought they were. And now he's going to go to the Swamp where – People are going to be jacked, and uh, that's going to be a different environment. 
Yeah, and it's going to be crazy. I know I've seen people trying to get tickets for the game and everybody is just raising the prices like crazy. They're like, hey, we can't risk Alabama fans getting in. We need as many Gator <laughs> fans as we have. We need to win that. And I think that's going to be huge. Like communication here for, I mean, Bama like, specifically, uh, that's going to be killer trying to communicate offensively and defensively for you guys because the crowd is just going to be loud and raucous and, I mean, rowdy, and I can't wait for it. Uh, and you mentioned earlier third and four and long, and they say that third and six is where you know you have a good quarterback and you're comfortable there. I don't think if I'm a fan of either of these teams, I don't think I'm comfortable with anything going on, especially – I know we've been kind of living and dying by the big play at this point. You know, most of our passing touchdowns have been big plays aside from, I believe the only short passing touchdown we had was a bubble screen in week one. And so it's been big play after big play. Even our rushing touchdowns have been big plays. Anthony Richardson had one in week one that was 73 yards. This past mm-hmm. week one that was 80 yards, but on that 80 yard touchdown run, he tweaked his hamstring. We don't know the severity, but we're told he's pract- he's going to practice. He'll play. But especially if we're forced to throw this ball now in third and long situations, um, I think we were right when we said it was going to be an ugly game at that point. And, I mean, a thing that I'm going to be looking for, a key matchup, I guess, is the Bama receivers against the Gators secondary because we have, outside of Kair Elam, who's starting outside, of course, and Travis Johnson, who's our star, we have Avery Helm and Jason Marshall Jr. starting on the other opposite corner side. And at one point they were just getting targeted because we play a lot of off coverage <laughs> and Bama's RPO game is it, it's been elite. Um, just the quick passing game. And so that's something I'm very worried about. It's just you guys getting the ball in space. And I mean, you guys have not a ton of experience this year receiver, but a ton of talent still as always. And so that's one thing that I'm worried about just you guys getting it short and then trying to make these plays against this young secondary is an inexperienced secondary for the most part is a, a key matchup for me because we need them to step up. Yeah. Um, look, and, and vice versa too. Uh, Jacob Copeland uh, certainly is a big time threat. Um, I do like Alabama's defensive backs. Here's the thing. Uh, last week against Mercer, one thing that hadn't been discussed very much is that Alabama did have a couple of defensive backs out with some you know minor stuff. If it had been Florida last week, they would have played. Um, but it was Mercer, and I think it was good to get some younger guys some experience. And uh, Alabama got beat for a couple of passing touchdowns. Now, it was after it was already 38 to nothing. So, I mean, mentally you may have checked out. But um, I think that the secondary has taken a mild amount of heat this week uh, because of that and uh, also because of Alabama's uh, expectations for themselves, the standard they've set is just ridiculously too high. It's just stupid high, and I, I get so irritated with some of our own fans who are like, I can't believe we gave up that touchdown. I'm like, we won 51-7. to seven. I mean, would you just let it go? Enjoy the moment. If you can't enjoy this. Um, but I do think that Florida's got some legit threats. And um, so, I mean, I, our defensive backs, while I like them a lot, love Jordan Battle, love uh, Josh Job. Again, we hadn't really had to face anybody yet that poses a problem. Uh, you thought for a minute with De'Eric King, Miami might, but boy, they had the worst game plan. They would have lost either way, but they had the worst game plan I've just about ever seen out of a D1 program <laughs> trying to attack us. So um, it's just going to be interesting to see what Dan Mullen's going to do. I think he's been a little clandestine with the the game plan so far. I mean, he's he, he's not going to tell us if Anthony Richardson's going to play. I think that's pretty obvious. And I don't blame him, um, but he seems to be very coy right now. Yeah, he's he's been uh, – it, it's one of those things where it's like I'm, I'm happy that we're doing that. Like we didn't really open up the playbook much in the first two games. Last week we opened it up a little bit more, but I think that was more just the coaching staff trying to think who who's going to make a play in the passing game at that point. And, uh, I mean, everybody did because we were playing South Florida, so it makes yeah. sense. But, but Emery made poor reads. I broke it down uh, yesterday on Lockdown Gators. <laughs> where he threw the interception, where he made the wrong read, the late read, and, I mean, just a poor throw, if we're being honest. But it, it's going to be uh, – it, it's interesting because I feel like we're going to kind of open up the playbook a bit, but I'm also thinking that we're going to try to just play keep away at a certain point. Yeah. But, uh, 
We'll be right back. We're going to look at keys to victory, betting odds, and predictions. I think we all know where everybody's going on this, but we're going to do it anyway. And I don't know about you guys, but football season is here. And now I'm constantly reminded, at least, of how much better physique these guys are in than me. So uh, I've got to start eating more Built Bar because I tend to eat way too many sugar-filled snacks. Built Bar is the best protein bar on the market. If you're trying to eat clean, but you've got a sweet tooth like me, I had some bourbon white chocolate before, I'm not going to lie to you. That is no longer a problem. Built Bar is your low calorie, low sugar, high protein, and high fiber solution. You can even enjoy it if you're keto. Remember to use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off of your next order. That is LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5 to get 15% off of your next order at Built Bar. Dot com. And all right, college football fanatics, have you heard about Prize Picks? Prize Picks is a daily fantasy made easy. I love this, and I know you will too. Prize Picks offers every sport you can think of NFL, college football, NBA, college basketball, MLB, soccer, MMA, and more. Prize Picks offers more college football props than anyone in the world and offers all the star players of the Power Five as well as the mid-majors you might have never even heard of, which I mentioned it before. I went to Toledo, so that's big for me, being able to bet on some guys that I know. Prize Fix allows mixed sport entries, so you can bet the over on LeBron rebounds combined with the under on Mahomes pass completions if you want. Don't hesitate. Check out prizefix.com or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize Fix is daily fantasy sports made easy. And now we're here to look at keys to victory, betting odds, and predictions. And I kind of want to start with the betting odds just to knock that one out of the way, if that's cool. Uh, The spread right now is, of course, Alabama's favored by 16 and a half. Luke, you you can take it away. Go ahead. Go nuts with it. Well, uh, I do want to – I'm curious. uh, Maybe you've seen it somewhere. When's the last time Florida was an underdog by that large of a margin at home? I haven't seen it, but I cannot imagine it's been – I'd imagine it's been a very long time since that. Because <laughs> like I'd be willing to bet it I, – I am a better, but I don't remember it being that high in 2011 when Alabama went there. I also don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't think it was at all. Well, my first inclination without giving my prediction away is Florida will cover that spread. Um, 16 points is a lot. Look, Alabama – when uh, the spreads come out, there's an Alabama factor involved. It's almost like you add three points. Like they always say being being at home is worth three points. Well, Alabama is uh, worth three points the other way. And um, it's – what's that? I said everywhere is home when you're Bama. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, (laughs) But, no, I think that that's true because people are so uh, caught up in the fact that Alabama is just going to blow everybody out, yada, yada, yada. And – while it's true to some degree, um, you know, I, th- I think that 16 points is a lot of points against a Dan Mullen coached Florida team at home. Um, with Alabama having their inexperience, I've already seen a lot of predictions, and I'm not talking about from just Alabama sites, uh, uh, national stuff, and they all have Alabama covering. Um, if that tells you anything, go against the grain here. <laughs> um, and that's where the money's made. So I feel like that line's a little bit high. If I were setting this spread myself, it'd be hover up more around 10. Um, and six extra points is a lot of extra points when it comes to betting. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm easily like, I'm going Florida covering this. I would anyway, but 16 and a half is a lot. And I have a feeling that our game plan is going to be keep the ball away from Alabama and take big shots when we can, but use the run game, use the short passing game to kind of just manage the clock and keep them, keep their offense at least off the field. Uh, mainly because, or not mainly, but partially because we haven't seen our running backs do much either. Like they've each gotten like five carries a game. And it's like, I feel like Dan Mullins is like, we're, we're going to just keep them ready, keep them fresh, because they're going to be running a lot against Alabama. So that's one of the reasons that I was thinking about it, just looking at our numbers. I was like, yeah, we're, we're probably just going to run a ton and then take shots whenever we can. Uh, the money line is minus 725 in Bama's favor and plus 545 for Florida. So um, not a lot of money if you're going to bet on Bama, or you need a lot of money if you want to win anything betting on Bama. Now, That's just the way it is. Yeah, it's, it's been that way for a while now, and uh, 
you know, I would say more often than not, it, it seems like it works out for Alabama, especially if you're going to take the money line. But, um, yeah, again, if I were betting on this, I wouldn't take the money line either way. I would I would take uh, the, the 16 points. Yeah, of course. And then the over-under is 59. What do, you, what do you think about that one? Well, if look, if we're going to go via your school of thought, then if Florida's going to play keep away, I think you have to go the under. Um, and I think the rule of thumb is also that uh, if you're going to take the underdog, you're better off betting on the under because you're just going to assume you hope for less points. I'm going to go the other way, though. I, th- I think that this could get, uh, you know, something like a 40 to 30 type game. Um, I-, I could easily see that. Alabama's averaging 46 points a game. Uh, I know they have not played stellar competition, but um, they, they've also left a lot of points on the field. I mean, they've also called the dogs off in, in both these games so far. And um, I think that that's also Alabama's mantra. And, and the whole, you know, we're going to keep the ball thing, or keep the ball away thing for, for when you're playing Alabama, that's awesome in theory. The problem is you got to go out there and do it. And Alabama is is – they got a good stout defense. I feel like uh, I thought Alabama had the best defense coming in the country coming into this season. I think Georgia might have it that now. I mean, I'm really impressed with the Bulldogs so far, but um, I, th- I think Alabama's got a stout, stout defense. And so to say, hey, we're just going to run the ball in three yards or a cloud of dust. The problem is, every now and again, Alabama's going to sack you for eight yards and a cloud of dust. So you know, it's really hard to run uh, that type of offense. And the other thing is, what if you do that and you punt? Alabama scores. You do. You have a nice little drive again. You, so you get a field goal. Alabama scores another touchdown. It's fourteen to three, and all of a sudden, it you get into a panic mode. You're like, we can't. You know, we got to try and score as quickly as we can against these dudes. And I think that's what happens with a lot of teams is uh, they also get caught up in the the blitzkrieg that Alabama has generally. And you know, you look up and you're like, hey, a minute ago it was seven to three, and now it's thirty five to ten. What the heck happened? Um, I've seen that happen in a lot of Alabama games. So um, I'm going to take the over and I'm going to take the Gators plus the points. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, I I know you mentioned it. if you're going the underdog, you're probably going to go the under. And I don't know why I'm speaking as if I have some kind of insight into what's actually <laughs> going to happen, but I'm, I'm taking the under and the Gators to cover. Um, not, not the spread at that point. I'm, I'm not going to do that one. But uh, what would you say the biggest or maybe one of the biggest keys to victory is for this week? I think the key to victory for Alabama is staying focused. Look, I, I feel very strongly about this. I think Alabama's the best team in the country. I think they got the most talent in the country. So if they go out there and they stay focused and they do what they're supposed to do, um, I feel like whoever they line up against, they'll win. Don't get caught up in the uh, the atmosphere. Don't just don't do it. Don't don't get caught up in. Um, the the way Florida is going to the, the crowd is going to try and change the game and they are and Florida's crowd is fantastic and um, they have the ability to change the game they certainly did in that Auburn game it felt like uh, and I've seen the YouTube video of Michael Piron another Mobile boy who uh, took off for about eighty yards in that game and, and the crowd going nuts and it, if that doesn't give you chills I don't care who you root for um, but that that to me is the key just Alabama be yourself don't get caught up in anything and and. You think that that's so easy because Nick Saban's been doing that for about 15 years now. The problem is with a brand new quarterback, with brand new receivers, with a running back room that's talented but inexperienced, um, with an offensive line that, you know, there's the work in progress. Chris Owens even gave up a sack against Mercer. So, uh, and, and a little banged up. It's not going to be that easy. So I think that uh, just, you know, keep your head on straight and don't get caught up in the moment. I think Alabama wins. Yeah, uh, I think for us, you know, the key to victory really has to be just pretty much all all on our defense is what I'm thinking. I know that our offense is, I mean, they've been taking their lumps against a lesser competition. They're going to take their lumps against Alabama. I'm going to hope that we can still keep uh, an explosive rushing attack because that's what we're at now uh, with eight and a half yards per carry going against Bama, who, who allows two yards per carry. So that's obviously going to be huge there. But I think defensively, a lot of it is we've had penalties when we shouldn't have had penalties. In week one, a lot of it was on our depth and our younger guys when they rotated in at the end of the blowout. But this past week, we had, I believe, one defensive penalty in the second half, and everything else was by the starters in the first half. So that's going to be huge for us. And taking the ball away, we haven't been able to do that against Nikosi Perry and Cade Fortin. We had one interception. And I I think that this is when you're – 
two and a half, I mean, three score underdog because it's 16 and a half. So three score underdog against a team like Bama and they're a team that's, they're going to score on you. It's just, you don't get a choice about that. They have just bulldozers on their offensive line. They're going to score. So I think a big part of it's trying to take the ball away, not getting killed up front is going to be huge. And I mean, I like that we have a good defensive line rotation. That's something that we haven't really had at least that I've been comfortable with in both rushing the passer and stopping the run. And yeah, I think up front it's going to be huge for us, which is the most basic way you can say to win a football game, but also our secondary needs to make some plays that they haven't really done so far. So what's your prediction? <sighs> I hate that I have to do this because now I have to say this on like now it's on the record, but I, I do think Bama wins, but I think it's going to be a, pretty close game and i i feel like it's going to be low scoring just because i feel like i i, I want to trust our secondary and i i again no reason to think this but i think we're going to play keep away and try to really open up the option game specifically because we've done rpos we haven't broken out any wonky options like uh any pre-stat motion options and leading into that so i feel like it's going to be low scoring I do think Alabama is going to win as much as as much as it pains me to admit, but uh, I, I want to say it's going to be somewhere along the lines of maybe 27, 24. I think it's wow. going to be a very close game, but I, I, I feel like it's going to be low scoring, which I suck at gambling. So I'm probably wrong. <laughs> well, let me say this. If Florida only loses 27, 24, they should move up in the polls, not down. I mean that in all sincerity. Um, I know, again, it sounds so cocky that a Bama fan is saying this. Number one, we've kind of earned the cockiness, let's be fair. Um, and secondly, I wasn't this cocky when Mike Shula was there. So let's <laughs> – I'll call a spade a spade. Um, but, yeah, I'm, go, I'm still going to go 40 to 30. Uh, this offense still has a lot of firepower, even though it's inexperienced. And um, I feel like what happens in games like this sometimes – is Alabama's going to get a lead, maybe even a two-score lead, and then something like a defensive touchdown. And then it's it's really tough, and, and I think you see the other team sort of lose their spirit. So I, I can see this game ending up being something like a 40-30. So I would definitely take Florida in the points and also take the over. All right. Good luck, Luke. <laughs> All right. Good luck, buddy. That about does it for today's episode of Locked On Gators. Join me tomorrow as we'll get further into this Alabama game. We'll look into some keys to victory for us, maybe. Maybe predictions this week. Who knows what we'll do Thursday. We're going to have fun with it. I'm trying to get a fun guest for Friday, but not sure if I'll be able to set it up. So, sorry. Once again, my name is Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. You can find all of my written work with Whole Nine Sports. So that's W-H-O-L-E. N-I-N-E Sports. Be sure to check out Locked On Bama, hosted by Jimmy Stein and Luke Robinson, who you just heard, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I know we hate them. They're fun to talk to, but we hate them, so screw them. But it's Bama week, so we're going to have some fun. Listen to them, get to know them, and get to hate them, because we're going to win. I'm just, I realize that I just contradicted myself, but I don't care. That's gambling. I'm gambling. I'm, I'm going to bet with my brain, but, you know, I'm going with my heart here. So Gators got it. No problem. Betting on the Gators doesn't have to be a problem or a guessing game. If you listen to the new Locked On Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling, get daily picks, blowout specials, wrong team favorite picks, and Lee Sterling's lock of the day. Follow the Locked On Bets podcast brought to you by betonline.ag wherever you listen to podcasts.